First of all, gender affirming care, if you just think about the words themselves, is a complete misdescription of what is going on here. First of all, it's not gender, it's sex. The purpose of these procedures is to modify primary and secondary sex traits, not gender. This is Manhattan Insights, a Manhattan Institute production. Lior, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, a, thanks for having me. A decade ago, gender identity wasn't considered an especially visible or urgent policy question. Now it is arguably one of the defining cultural controversies in American public life. How exactly did that happen? How did this issue go from the fringes to being at the center of things? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't think there was one cause. I think this is very much a, a perfect storm type scenario that we're looking at. And I, I would identify four major causes. Um, the first is, you know, a lo the, the long streak of uh, individualism uh, that's deeply embedded within American political tradition, uh, American political culture. And, um, you know, that individualism took a therapeutic turn after the 1960s. Um, and it, that was really ramped up, I think, especially in the 1990s. Um, but what I mean by that therapeutic term, because different people have different interpretations of that, but what I mean by that is, at least in this context, um, our inclination to interpret, you know, the, the old promise of the pursuit of happiness um, in, in therapeutic and sometimes even distinctly medical terms. So, uh, you know, being happy or being, uh, or I should say, being unhappy in life or unsatisfied, dissatisfied, um, is now a mental health problem. And if it's a mental health problem, then presum presumably it has a uh, a scientific, professional, mental health, or even medical solution. Um, so that's really one important background factor, the, the therapeutic turn in our uh, individualistic culture. Um, the second cause is the rise of the civil rights state. Um, it's a term I, I borrow from my uh, mentor at Boston College, Shep Melnick, and uh, it, it refers to uh, a wide range of institutions that interpret and enforce civil rights laws, judicial decrees, um, many of them, I would say most of them, um, completely invisible to the vast majority of the American public. You know, most people know of, uh, of uh, Brown versus Board of Education, um, but they don't know of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the many uh, guidance documents and lower court rulings that came in its wake. And the same has to do, uh, the same you can find in the area of um, sex and gender policy. Um, a lot of these documents, a lot of these um, guide, guidelines and court rulings are um, completely obscure to the average citizen and known only to a very small number of um, professional experts, um, uh, prof usually professional policy entrepreneurs who have developed um, a high degree of sophistication in understanding and manipulating, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, I, I mean that in a, a very narrow technical sense, understanding and manipulating um, the complexities of the administrative state. Um, and that is a, a big part of the story behind how the federal government under the Obama administration um, waded into the waters of uh, transgender issues and gender identity politics in particular. Um, the third factor is the change in our universities. Um, universities, is, you know, it's no secret, they're left-leaning. They've become uh, a lot more left-leaning over the years since the, uh, you know, the student movement, the new left of the 1960s and 1970s. Um, but I think what's especially important for our purposes is that um, they have become more orthodox, um, less tolerance for diverging viewpoints, um, and uh, more effort in their recruitment to bring on students who already agree with these orthodoxies and um, in whom they can be further uh, uh, in, in engraved. And the consequence of that, Rehan, is that we have a new generation of young, um, uh, you know, ideologically homogeneous, we would call them woke, um, graduates from uh, our most elite schools uh, seeking to enter the professions and more importantly to achieve positions of influence within our major institutions of American life. And this is of course true of um, uh, you know, the medical field uh, and the medical associations which have been um, front and center in propagating gender ideology in medicine and in education and in a variety of other contexts.
So the, the, the advent of this new professional class with homogeneous ideas about what constitutes justice and social justice is also a very key point here. Um, and then I think fourth and finally um, is the, uh, the emergence of new technologies, um, specifically smartphone technology and social media. Um, and this is important because it has allowed a generation of especially young people um, to access new, radical, and frankly, untested ideas. Um, ideas about human nature, about what it means to be free, what it means to live a good life, um, how they should understand and relate to authority, especially uh, um, traditional authority, um, which you, know, you and I would regard as um, uh, you know, possessor of a kind of wisdom that comes from long-standing experience as opposed to just um, living in the world of academic theory. Um, and uh, social media has really become a vector for the uh, transformation of um, youth, not just in terms of their um, uh, the ideas, um, the culture in which they swim, um, but also in terms of their mental health. We have um, you know, a lot of emerging data uh, and research, good research, on uh, uh, showing the, the strong correlation between the advent of social media and the collapse of in mental health among the young generation. And that is a big part of the story behind um, gender identity and the rise of, of transgender politics. Lior, one of the big buzzwords in the debate over gender is gender-affirming care. There's this language of harm, this idea that if you reject um, certain ideas about gender identity, what it means, that you are, in fact, damaging people. Uh, that's something that is obviously very discomforting. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk to us about that language and, and what it means. Sure. Sure. So, um, first of all, gender-affirming care, um, if you just think about the words themselves, um, is a complete misdescription of what is going on here. First of all, um, what's, it's not gender, it's sex. Um, the purpose of these procedures is to modify primary and secondary sex traits, um, not gender, at least not in the um, meaning of gender that we have come to understand um, through uh, feminism especially. Um, second of all, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing being affirmed here. Um, there's something being changed. The sex traits are being changed, modified, um, to make a person resemble uh, an individual of the opposite sex, or increasingly, we've come to understand um, no sex at all. Um, and then, of course, care, whether or not these procedures constitute care, as opposed to you know, well-intended well uh, medical harm, is the entire debate in a nutshell. So gender-affirming care is very good marketing, um, but it's not a neutral term, and it's disappointing to see uh, uh, you know, uh, prominent journalists at um, respected and respectable institutions using this term as if it is a neutral and medical and, and purely scientific um, concept when it really isn't. Um, but in any case, um, yes, gender affirming care sounds like it's something uh, very good um, that, that, you know, the, the denial of which would constitute some kind of harm or even cruelty. Um, but you know, we know based on uh, extensive reviews of the evidence of the research behind this protocol that in fact, there is no uh, good evidence that it's um, necessary or that it produces benefits um, that, uh, that outweigh the harms. Um, and I think one of the reasons why it's taken root in, in our culture is not only because um, the medical associations endorse it, and we can talk about that if you'd like, um, but also because again, it's just very clever marketing. It's very difficult for um, well-meaning, compassionate liberals in particular um, to, to look at a term like this and say, no, no, this is unscientific, this is medically harmful. So what you're saying is that there's a cultural dimension, um, the term care, um, you know, to affirm, these are things that have a positive valence, and yet it's not just culture, it's also about the institutions uh, that uh, embed a certain set of ideas. Um, you know, that language is itself something that is meant to kind of bend the conversation and even scientific inquiry in a particular direction. That's right. That's right. Um, and I think the role of uh, groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Endocrine Society um, has been over the past few years to provide a kind of scientific veneer, um, a gloss um, over these ideas that are fundamentally ideological and not scientific in nature, um, and that I should point out have very flimsy um, intellectual underpinnings. Um, what's interesting is that if you read the origins of uh, you know, where 
uh, transgender thought, gender identity concepts came from from the academy. Um, uh, you'll find scholars of this issue uh, um, who support uh, the transgender cause saying there is a great deal of incoherence, of indeterminacy in terms of what it is that we're talking about, um, in terms of the, the conflicting ideas and ideals that, that, uh, that fuel this movement. Um, so to the public, certainly when uh, refracted through the lens of the medical associations, they present this as a coherent and internally consistent um, uh, scientific um, outlook on human nature. Um, but when they talk to themselves behind closed doors in academic settings, um, they not only admit that it's incoherent and, and internally inconsistent, but they relish in those uh, inconsistencies um, and incoherencies. And that's part of, of course, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's overlap with, with queer theory, um, which is all about, you know, disrupting the normal, introducing incoherence, um, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, I, I would say that it's, um, uh, it, it's one of those gender affirming care is one of those concepts that makes perfect sense as long as you're not willing to look behind the curtain. When you talk about the civil rights state and when you talk about how these ideas are institutionalized, it occurs to me that when you're thinking about administrative agencies, when you're thinking about courts, uh, you know, you kind of need to operate in the domain of clarity bright line rules. Um, you're taking administrative actions and they need to be more or less coherent so they can provide meaningful guidance to other institutions operating under their authority. Uh, talk to us a bit about the advent of the civil rights state, you know, which is of course something that you know, long predates um, the advent of this debate over gender ideology and, and how these two things have intersected. Sure. So, um, and I, I'm going to limit myself to talking here about uh, gen transgender policy um, and maybe with a specific focus on the medical side of things. But, um, you know, the, the civil rights state was really founded in a series of court decisions followed by congressional um, uh, enactments, uh, particularly the Civil Rights Act of 1964, that created um, uh, federal bureaucracies uh, devoted at first to the enforcement of Brown versus Board of Education and later other uh, major um, uh, Supreme Court rulings on sex and disability. Um, but And this uh, represented a break. It, this was a change in the history of how right. um, the American state operated. Right. I mean, there's an ongoing debate among scholars of we about whether this was, in fact, a break from the co original constitutional understanding um, as articulated by the founders or... Uh, you know, making real on the promise, so to speak, of that um, of, the, of that vision. Um, but I think na by now, I think it's it's quite clear to most Americans that um, certainly um, on issues of gender and race, um, there are ways in which the civil rights state and its actions departs from any reasonable interpretation of the uh, of the historical constitution. Um, but you know, when, when we're talking about Title IX, for example, Title IX was passed in 1972. Um, without pretty much any thought about um, what it would mean for, um, uh, you know, uh, sexual harassment, which actually wasn't even And for a those of you who are not as familiar yeah. with Title IX, can you just give us a yeah. bit more context? Sure. So Title IX was um, a law passed in 1972. Um, uh, and um, it says it, it's a very short law statute. And it says uh, any educational institution that receives federal funding as a condition of receiving that federal funding may not discriminate on the basis of sex. Um, and, you know, it was passed without much attention, without much debate. Um, and it very quickly became clear in the wake of Title IX's passage that, um, that this would run into uh, serious problems of interpretation and enforcement. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that we're, we're, when we're talking about race, uh, at least at the time, the accepted norm as articulated by the courts was that, you know, uh, race is not relevant grounds for treating people differently. Um, but when it comes to sex, um, clearly there are some areas in of life in which sex is a relevant ground for treating people differently, meaning um, the appropriate norm here is separate and therefore equal. Um, so then the question became, how do we measure equality, um, especially in the air, uh, on the issue of women's sports at first, um, and then on the question of sexual harassment, which wasn't even a word when Title IX passed, it, it only became a word uh, later on, um, uh, you know, through a series of court rulings, um, the federal government got involved in regulating how schools uh, interpret and enforce sexual harassment, um, both from uh, teachers against students, but also between students. 
Um, and then during the Obama years, uh, the, uh, the sexual harassment prong of, uh, of the civil rights state morphed into a gender identity prong and took on a life of its own. And that's what we're seeing now, especially uh, with regard to schools. Um, we, saw this, uh, we saw this in the uh, uh, passage of Obamacare and the interpretation of one of its provisions in a way that um, uh, transgender advocates have argued requires uh, for example, state Medicaid programs to cover various sex reassignment um, surgeries and, and drugs. Um, so, you know, it, the civil rights state is a, a, a sprawling, highly complicated um, network of institutions, especially courts and um, agencies um, that interpret and enforce civil rights statutes and federal um, court rulings uh, in ways that uh, the originators of those rulings and statutes may never have intended and it may even go against their original intentions. Tell us a bit about this conveyor belt from uh, anti-harassment measures uh, to this um, radically changed uh, administrative treatment of gender identity. What was the path sure. there? Sure. So um, in 2010, the Obama White House convened a summit on bullying. Um, and there was actually a, a good justification for that, again, because we were just entering the area of smartphones and social media and students and schools had found new ways to, to harass each other and bully each other in ways that were quite devastating to especially the most vulnerable of students. And schools didn't really have a good way to respond to this, um, not just because teachers can't monitor social media, uh, but also because schools have historically been under st strong um, uh, uh, constraints due to how the federal courts have interpreted the First Just Amendment. Just to be clear, so concern about harassment is something that had been around for some time since at least the late 1980s, 1990s, and uh, that had become a kind of familiar concern. And it also, uh, the civil rights state did play a role there in trying to inhibit harassment and change uh, workplaces and, and other environments to try to kind of limit it. So then that happened having been well established as an idea. Now here in 2010, um, you know, sometime later, it gets extended uh, through this kind of anti-bullying push. So it's true that, um, that the courts had recognized anti-harassment as an appropriate interpretation of uh, federal civil rights law, especially in employment. But in the case of education, the court had said, you know, you have to be very careful here because speech that can be construed by some people as bullying, harassing, or creating um, a hostile environment um, you know, th that, first of all, that is speech. Um, and, and in the context of education, we want people to say provocative things. That's the, you know, that, the robust exchange of ideas and the preparation of young people for life in a, in a, uh, you know, in, in, in a democracy where people vehemently disagree with each other requires students to grow a thick skin and to, to understand. So there's already to, some controversy yeah. about the meaning right. of what it means to, um, exactly. you know, have anti-harassment measures in place. But it seems that by the time you get to 2010, um, that debate, when you're looking at um, major universities, for example, uh, they've been more or less choosing a side in that debate uh, as to whether or not you prioritize anti-harassment over free speech. Because well, I think by 2010, it wasn't as clear as it would be a decade later, or even five years later. I think that what you're describing probably is a, a better description of the mid 2010s mm -hmm. okay. after, again, after the Obama administration had gotten involved in this issue and changed its interpretation of Title IX. So what happened was, the White House convenes this summit in 2010, and um, and I'm very loosely paraphrasing here. Um, they basically say, look, uh, you know, federal precedent does not allow us to um, to tackle what we consider harassing speech because of uh, students' First Amendment rights. Um, but what we can do is we can use Title IX and, and Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which concerns race, and we can interpret these to mean that you cannot uh, uh, you cannot speak in ways that create uh, an environment in which certain groups of people feel uncomfortable. Um, uh, meaning that's the interpretation that they give to anti-harassment. Now, uh, over the next three years, <clears throat> uh, uh, civil rights organizations that had already been um, starting to think seriously about taking on the trans issue, because they had historically been uh, very focused on gay rights, um, especially marriage, military service, uh, uh, employment discrimination, um, they started filing complaints with the Office for Civil Rights in a number of law school, uh, sorry, in a number of um, K through 12 schools saying, look, we have a student here identifies as the opposite sex, um, you know, wants to use the locker rooms or the bathrooms of the sex that, that he feels comfortable in. 
um, but isn't allowed to do so. And that's leading to uh, harassment by his peers and um, the exclusion of the student from his desired facilities in and of itself feels harassing to the student, right? It feels like he's being harassed by the school. And isn't this a reasonable interpretation of what you, Office for Civil Rights, have just called uh, um, uh, harassment under Title IX? And so the Office for Civil Rights launches in investigations. And as you probably know, Rehan, sometimes the process is the punishment, um, and schools who, uh, you know, had to go through these uh, expensive and very embarrassing investigations were very quickly pressured into signing um, consent decrees with the Office, Office for Civil Rights, where they unilaterally agreed to change their policies, um, even though there had never been any change in statute or in court decisions. This was just OCR saying this is how we want you to interpret the law. So it, there's this incredible leverage of these federal agencies interpreting a law you know, um, drafted decades ago in this very different context. And uh, it's not something where there was democratic deliberation around it. But, you know, naturally, you're running a school and you don't want this to become a massive distraction. So you change your policies. Right. That's right. And what happens over the next few years is that um, uh, federal courts and the Office for Civil Rights um, take incremental steps past one another to expand the reach of Title IX into this new area of policy, um, the accommodation of students who, who reject their sex. Um, and each one of those institutions says, I'm not doing anything new. I'm just following the guidance or the precedent set by the other institutions. So that allowed judges who are always very anxious about having their opinions um, be construed as innovation, as, as policymaking, right, as legislating from the bench. Um, that allowed judges to say, this is nothing new. We're just deferring under um, canons of administrative law. We're just deferring to the Office for Civil Rights. While the Office for Civil Rights and its own decrees and its own um, guidance documents said, we're not doing anything new. We're just deferring to the courts. Um, and so you get this increment, uh, incremental expansion of the policy regime without... There's a strangely recursive element to it because you have one agency saying I'm deferring to you, the other one saying I'm deferring to you, back and forth. I wonder just briefly if you could tell us a bit about the Office of Civil Rights, um, you know, if there's some sort of sociological dimension, you know, just, uh, you know, who are the people who gravitate to serving in this administrative agency? I imagine there are many occasions where even in the Obama or Biden administrations, people will feel as though, look, this is not something that I'm focused on day to day. There are people I appoint to these roles and, and perhaps they have a certain inclination or perhaps a certain kind of person is drawn to serving in those agencies? Office. Yes, I think you, you accurately characterize what goes on there. Um, the, the type of person who is attracted to the Office for Civil Rights in, um, from the get-go is likely to be, you know, a lawyer who has a strong belief that America is um, has a long way to go in terms of civil rights, um, who has a very expansive and probably um, not very consensus-based um, interpretation of civil rights laws and judicial rulings. Um, so that agency, especially under democratic administrations, because remember that unlike in European parliamentary systems, the American bureaucracy by design is a lot more politicized. It's a lot more um, open to political appointments. Um, uh, and, so, and, and so Democrat uh, administrations are more likely to staff uh, the, the, high, you know, the high ranks of OCR with activists. And, and we've seen this with um, both the Biden and the Obama administrations. Um, appointment of Catherine Lehman um, to head OCR. She now is still the chief of OCR, and she was during most of the Obama administration. Um, and she is the very definition of an ideologically driven activist, um, you know, kind of very far to the left of most Americans on issues of um, race and gender. Um, and, um, you know, she has a, a long history of involvement with the ACLU. Um, and that's you know, another dimension of this is uh, what political scientists sometimes call issue networks. And the, this refers to uh, you know, a network of professionals, many of them policy entrepreneurs, um, inside and outside of government um, that occupy various positions, sometimes um, in, in advocacy groups, and then they go into government, and then they go back to the advocacy organization. I'm suing you and I'm outside government in the advocacy group, then I'm inside government, and then I'm actually still connected to the people in the advocacy group I was once a part of, and there's this kind of push and pull, but we are kind of moving the institutions together. That's right. So just to give you an example, in the Fourth Circuit case, GG versus Gloucester, which was the first federal uh, circuit ruling um, in favor of a transgender student plaintiff um, against a school district, 
Um, you know, the ACLU was the organization involved in litigation there. Catherine Lehman was at, in the Obama Office for Civil Rights, and she is also an ACLU lawyer. And one of the judges, at least one of the judges, maybe even two, I'd have to check my notes, but at least one of the three judges on the Fourth Circuit who ruled in favor of the plaintiff is also a, a former ACLU person. Um, and you see this, you know, this is a fairly consistent finding in how the civil rights state works nowadays, where you have um, lawyers who maybe even know each other um, through these advocacy organization networks, but regardless are, are very ideologically and institutionally aligned. Um, who kind of rotate in and out of government in positions of influence. And because these were issues that, in the past at least, were low salience, these are things where these issue networks are able to move the ball very far um, without much scrutiny, uh, and uh, then suddenly you wake up and then and suddenly the landscape is just drastically different than it had been just a few years ago. That's right. And I think one of the reasons why gender ideology is such an incoherent mishmash of different ideas and attitudes that are in contradiction with each other is because the American civil rights state allows for extensive policy innovation on the basis of analogies, uh, highly abstract, superficially plausible analogies. And transgender rights perfectly illustrates um, how this works. Because what, what happened during the 2010s is that you had advocacy organizations making claims in federal court that um, transgender students should not be excluded from the gender from the bathroom of their choice because doing so would would be not much different from excluding black kids from white all white schools, um, and you know even Loretta Lynch, the attorney general, the Obama administration's attorney general, when she justified her her depart her division's um, uh, decision to sue the state of North Carolina over HB two, which was a law that requires people to use the bathroom consistent with their biological sex. Um, even in her speech, she said, she said, you know, it wasn't long ago when states like North Carolina had signs above restrooms and water fountains that kept people out based on a distinction without a difference. Um, now, of course, whether this, whether it's a distinction without a difference in the, in the transgender context is the entire debate in a nutshell. Yeah, you can't just say it's similar to black civil rights case closed. Um, and we've seen the use of analogy, um, uh, 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 very successful in the United States. Um, we still see, still see it all the time now. Anytime transgender um, activists want to, you know, uh, criticize a certain law, they'll usually say things like, um, they're coming for us now. Next, they're going to come for gay and lesbian Americans. Um, next, they're going to want to dismantle same-sex marriage. You know, um, it's always analogies to gay rights. And the same thing with conversion therapy that you mentioned earlier. Um, the idea that um, trying to help a child who feels distressed or alienated from her body come to terms with her sex and not have to go through risky and experimental medical procedures, the idea that that is conversion therapy um, is not only implausible on its face, it contradicts decades of research, but it, it's managed to gain a foothold in the medical community and more importantly in the judicial and the legal profession precisely because of its superficial analogy to, to gay rights. Lior, there's another dimension to the controversy over gender ideology, which is the role of medical institutions, medical practice, and how that's intersecting um, with this um, with this dilemma. So talk to us about how medical schools and medical practitioners uh, have been changing the playing field. Kind of in the United States... Unlike in European countries, we don't have a powerful centralized healthcare bureaucracy um, that's able to issue treatment guidelines and directives from top uh, to bottom and have um, have its its directives enforced and respected. Um, and that has a lot to do with the uh, our tradition of individualism, of you know uh, uh, respect for the sacrosanct um, relationship of the doctor and the patient, and res and in our distrust of centralized authority. Um, but the, the practical effect of that is that um, the institutions that are set up to make most medical decisions um, with regard to um, clinical practice guidelines, standards of care, are the professional medical associations. Um, so, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Endocrine Society, um, and uh, the, double, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health have been the three most important, by far most important, medical associations shaping how the medical community thinks about and responds to um, children who feel alienated from their bodies. Now, um, what's interesting about these groups um, is that uh, they are first and foremost trade unions. Um, so, you know, th they call themselves 
professional medical associations. But the word professional here really has two meanings. One meaning is they're professional in the sense that, you know, you and I would show up uh, in a suit and tie for an interview. They act professionally, ideally. Um, but the other meaning of professional is that they are associations of professionals, of highly trained, highly credentialed professionals. And so that ambiguity, I think, can easily mislead people into thinking that if a trade association of professionals says something, what it's saying is professional. And that, I mean, certainly in the case of gender medicine, that's clearly not the case. And it's interesting to me that we, you know, Americans, even on the left, readily recognize this problem when it comes to teachers unions. Um, teachers unions claim that all they care about is education. We know that that's not true. Um, obviously, teachers unions, insofar as they're staffed with teachers, care about education, but in any case, or the interests of students, but in any case where the interest of students um, conflicts with the interests of teachers, teachers unions are always going to prefer the interests of teachers. So to put a fine point on it, these are organizations that are not solely engaged in neutral scientific inquiry on a question of public interest, uh, but rather they are advocates um, for um, a particular approach for an industry and that they need to be understood as advocates. I don't want to be too cynical about it. You know, again, these associations are staffed with professionals in the field. So presumably, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics is staffed with people who care deeply about pediatric health. Um, it's just that the organization has different incentives um, then, uh, th then would dictate that they always care about patient health. So in a situation, for example, where a non-insignificant number of their members have engaged in a medical practice that is now, um, uh, uh, that is now thought to be harmful, um, or unscientific. Um, these organizations are very likely going to try to defend those doctors and not back away from that position. And there's, you know, there's multiple examples of this throughout history of medical associations um, making recommendations that are in conflict with patient health. Uh, I think the most easy to, to recognize for most people is, you know, when, when um, big pharma dollars influence, you know, for example, the American uh, Pain Society, APS, um, was a main driver behind the opioid epidemic um, because it said that, you know, drugs like OxyContin have a very low addiction rate and they're safe to use and so on and so forth. It was later discovered that they received a large amount of money from um, Purdue Pharma. Um, but here, in the case of gender medicine, the influence is not, I would say, is not uh, primarily that of drug companies, although it seems like there, there is some influence of drug companies behind the scenes. Um, it's more uh, ideology. Um, it's, it's what I've been calling institutional capture, um, meaning the way in which a, a small, highly organized and well-motivated group of clinicians um, can impose their policy preferences on a, uh, 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 against the, um, uh, the will or, or the indifference, I should say, of a diffuse um, uh, membership that either doesn't know what's going on or doesn't want to stick their necks out and, and say something. Um, or who reasonably believe that, you know, different areas of pediatrics have different um, types of expertise and they're going to defer to the to those who have expertise in gender issues. So there's a kind of two step process in which y you manufacture uh, what you might call a false consensus. And then having manufactured that false consensus, then institutional capture flows from that. There may well be dissenting voices, but you know, life for those dissenting voices becomes much more difficult when it appears as though there is a professional consensus. And so that gives leverage to, say, the activists within the organization who then want to unify the organization uh, behind a, a given practice or approach. That's exactly right. And that's what we've been seeing in the American medical field. Um, so so, uh, you know, talking about this manufactured consensus point, you know, the AAP, the Endocrine Society and WPATH are the three major organizations to have issued either treatment guidelines or policy statements in support of gender affirming care for, for kids. Um, the other medical associations, by and large, defer to these three. Um, and so that gives the appearance that it's not just three organizations that are aligned on this issue. It's the entire medical community. Um, and that, of course, assumes that the medical associations uh, credibly speak on behalf of all of their members. Um, and certainly on this issue, 
not only is there no evidence that that's the case, but there is actually growing evidence that that's not the case. Perf so I wonder if you could bring in the comparative context here. You mentioned earlier on that when you're looking at, uh, and in your work you've often discussed, uh, the fact that when you're looking at other market democracies um, in Western Europe, for example, um, oftentimes uh, you're seeing a very different approach um, to pediatric gender interventions um, writ large. Uh, so talk to us about that, the how the decentralized nature uh, of the kind of medical field uh, in the U.S. Uh, has led us down a different path than what you're seeing uh, in these other countries. Our gender affirming model of care was adopted in the early 2010s in Sweden, Finland, uh, the U.K. And what happened over the next decade is as more and more evidence of the harms of this model and its unscientific basis came out, um, these countries, because they have centralized healthcare bureaucracies, they have a mechanism for dealing with that. So, you know, in Finland, for example, uh, Finland has a strong public health insurance um, uh, regime and most people are insured by it. And that means that uh, in order for certain treatments to be covered under national health insurance, they first have to go through um, a process of scientific vetting. And that uh, typically means systematic reviews of evidence, which is the, the highest form of evidence evaluation in evidence-based medicine. And so you have organization, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the institution called COHERE, the Council for Choices uh, in Healthcare, which is um, Finland's main, <clears throat> main body to evaluate the evidence based of certain treatments and therefore recommend whether they should be funded or not. And COHERE did a systematic review and found that, in fact, the, the evidence for the benefits of these interventions is extremely weak. Um, and the same happened in, in Sweden with its SBU and, of course, in the UK with an institute called the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, or NICE. Um, so when you have a centralized healthcare bureaucracy backed up by a strong public health insurance um, uh, regime, um, you have the institutional incentives to make sure that the treatments that are funded, because they're funded with, ta with scarce taxpayer dollars, um, that, they are, that they're only funding evidence-based treatments. In the United States, things are, of course, very different. Um, our healthcare system is, um, to put it mildly, a mess. Um, it's a mixture of public and private options, public and private institutions. It's highly decentralized. Um, it's not just decentralized from the federal to the state level, but it's also decentralized from the state level through its medical boards to, um, uh, to medical associations and even to individual doctors. Um, so there's a kind of a, a, a it, it all starts from a position of deep distrust of, of centralized authority and rulemaking. And, you know, you see you saw this, for example, in the lead up to the passage of Obamacare, when Republicans were complaining about so-called death panels. And what they meant by that is we don't want there to be um, a bureaucracy that rations care, that decides what's going to get treated and what's not according to considerations of economy. Um, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic to that argument, but at the same time, it does have its downsides. And I think what we're seeing now with pediatric gender medicine is very much one of its downsides um, because the, the incentives to conduct um, systematic evidence reviews and to hold accountable a particular institution and particular people simply don't exist in the United States. There's another dimension that's worth touching on, which is uh, the dramatic increase in the number of young people who report experiencing gender dysphoria. Now, you've talked about how the kind of institutional context has changed the role of the civil rights state. You've also talked about how um, the kind of medical understanding uh, of gender dysphoria and what are appropriate interventions has changed because of the separate dynamic uh, of institutional capture um, in the professions in our highly decentralized uh, context in which um, these professional associations in which civil society play a larger role than some centralized bureaucracy. But then you just do have this brute fact that relative to when uh, this debate was really heating up, uh, you know, when you had this bullying conversation in the early 2010s, it's just um, you know, gender dysphoria has just become incredibly widespread. And I wonder if you could talk to us about that and if there are any uh, interactions uh, between that uh, population level shift uh, and these kind of institutional shifts that you've been describing. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, the causes behind the explosion of transgender identity and gender dysphoria diagnoses, and those two things are not necessarily the same, although there is a, obviously a strong overlap between the two, um, over the past decade, decade and a half, is of course a subject of, of controversy. Um, I think all you're know, looking at all the available evidence that we have, 
Um, it seems uh, very likely, um, I don't want to say anything with certainty, but it says extremely likely um, that uh, the, the reason why we're seeing um, you know, increases of uh, anywhere between, um, so just to put some numbers on it, um, when you and I were in high school, Rehan, we probably did not know a single student who identified as transgender. In fact, the word probably had not even entered mainstream parlance at that time. We may have known some students who were gender nonconforming, but, but definitely not students who wanted to be regarded as members of the opposite sex. Um, now, according to national surveys and surveys done on particular school districts throughout the country, um, the percentage of students who are identifying as transgender in K-12 schools is between 2.1 and 9.2%. So in Pittsburgh schools, for example, almost 1 in 10 high school students identifies as transgender. Um, and that's, of course, that's a, uh, you know, that's a monumental change in youth culture um, within the course of less than a generation. Um, similarly, with gender dysphoria diagnoses, you know, the condition, um, even in the DSM-5, which was published in 2013, it says that the prevalence of gender dysphoria in the adult population is between 0.002% and 0.014%, depending on sex. Um, so it's a, and th that's an adult, and it's extremely rare. Um, but now, you know, we've seen over the past few years, we have some good data coming out of um, uh, investigative reporting by Reuters showing that the rates of gender dysphoria diagnoses among kids uh, ages 6 to 17 have gone up um, between 2017 and 2020. They went up by 20 percent annually. And between 2020 and 2021, they went up by 70 percent. Mind you, that is the year of COVID when, when kids were at home by themselves, mostly on their phones. Um, and there's also a change uh, when you're looking at uh, sex. So, for example, when you're looking at uh, gender nonconforming behavior, transgender identification, it used to be mostly boys when you're looking at minors. Uh, and now it seems that it is very, very heavily skewed towards girls. That's right. So the two classic presentations of gender dysphoria, or as that was called until recently, gender identity disorder, um, the, the majority of presentations was adult males. So uh, these were adult male transsexuals wanted to pass as women. Um, there's a theory that, you know, many of them are autogynophiliac, meaning they have erotic attraction to the image of themselves as women. Um, but there were a few, you know, it was, uh, it was known that, that there were some kids, young children in particular, and especially boys, who also started showing signs of kind of cross-gender behavior and, and feelings, and there was a theory in the air that at least some of these boys are likely to grow up and be those older adults, right? Um, that there's a kind of connection between these two phenomena. Um, what happened over the past 15 years is that a new subgroup, a new cohort um, starts to emerge. And that is teenagers with no prior history of gender-related issues, gender-related distress, um, uh, beginning in toddlerhood. Um, so these are teenagers whose uh, problems with, with you know, feelings of, of alienation from their own bodies, their own sex, first come up during or after the onset of puberty. Um, and uh, most of these teenagers are girls, not boys. And the vast majority of them have uh, significant coexisting psychological problems, anxiety, depression, um, suicidality, eating disorders, ADHD, autism is extremely common in this cohort. Um, and so, you know, there was kind of a, an assumption on part of the gender affirming advocates, um, the, the clinicians um, who, who practiced uh, this intervention, um, that the same research that applies to these young boys um, is going to apply um, flawlessly uh, in the new cohort. And of course, that's what the European countries have um, uh, gradually recognized is not the case. Um, and uh, we have uh, emerging evidence that uh, social influences are behind um, the, the explosion in this new third category of adolescent onset, or as we tend to call it now, rapid onset gender dysphoria. I wonder, uh, Lior, you have uh, done tremendous journalism, you've done tremendous scholarly work understanding this incredible shift, uh, the ways in which these different changes in our institutions uh, have contributed to the ongoing controversy 
over gender identity in American life. Uh, talk to us a bit about where we're headed next. Uh, so I don't need to tell you that this has become a very politically polarized debate, uh, and you have a number of state legislatures around the country that have sought to, for example, uh, restrict pediatric gender interventions. Uh, this has, of course, um, caused a great deal of controversy. Uh, but I wonder if you could talk to us about, you know, first of all, those legislative battles, and then separately, when you're talking about these professional associations, when you're talking about the institutional capture of these kind of core, very influential medical institutions, um, you know, I wonder, uh, you can pass all the laws that you want, but it seems like that is something that would be very difficult to dislodge or change. So, so talk to us about those those two aspects. Sure, sure. Okay, so, I mean, I'm often asked, Rehan, how is this going to end? When and how? Um, and I think there's a, a number of factors that are that, that's going to bring the scandal, um, if not to a grinding halt, then at least it's going to, you know, uh, something close to it. Um, the first is, of course, uh, lawsuits filed by kids who were harmed by these interventions. And that's going to take some time, partly because, um, you know, it takes time for regret to manifest, for the kids to come to, to terms with what they've done to themselves, um, especially with, with girls, you know, getting double mastectomies, for example, What's going to happen when they're in their 30s and all of a sudden they realize they can't breastfeed and, and they, they regret their decision and so on and so forth. So the first thing that has to happen is malpractice lawsuits. And there's two barriers to malpractice lawsuits from uh, detransitioners right now. Um, the first barrier is that um, states' uh, uh, um, statutes of limitations are one to three years. And um, frankly, it just takes longer than that for most people to realize their mistake because we know that there's a period um, of, of uh, a year or two after uh, these medical treatments are initiated. Um, we call it sometimes the hormone high, which is where, you know, due to placebo effects, Hawthorne effects, um, whatever, um, the kids who get these medications feel better in the short term. Um, so uh, many of them are just going to miss the, the, the window of statutes of limitations. The other problem to these malpractice lawsuits is that standards of care are established in litigation, in malpractice litigation. That's another kind of unique um, uh, you know, phenomenon of American healthcare. And um, as long as you have the, the entire uh, you know, medical establishment, or I shouldn't say that because that's misleading, as long as you have most major medical associations in their official capacity lining up behind the doctors who are being sued, um, it's very unlikely that a doctor, that a judge, a federal judge or a state judge is going to second guess the medical community on that regard. Um, so that's one, one, uh, 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 you know, avenue for, for ending the scandal and, and the barriers there. The other is, as you mentioned, um, you know, there's now 20 states that have uh, enacted laws um, that aim to impose age restrictions, age limits on the administration of these treatments. Um, and every single one of these laws, if it isn't already being litigated in the courts, will be litigated in the courts. Um, and we have faced a number of significant barriers, not least of which is that the medical associations always line up against the states. Um, but other, some of the other impediments have to do with uh, the unique nature of courts as policymaking institutions. So, for example, um, you think about a scenario in which you have a state, let's say Texas or Kentucky or Tennessee, um, trying to defend its age restrictions in court. You have the attorney general's office who get this case that falls into their lap. They have a few weeks to familiarize themselves with a, a huge amount of medical literature and medical policy in, in the United States and in other countries. And they do this while they're also working on other cases. Um, and they're going to be, uh, uh, you know, lining up against on the other side, the ACLU or the Transgender Law Center, which has been doing nothing but this type of litigation for the last eight, nine years. And where the issue networks um, see to it that you have uh, folks who come from these advocacy organizations or are tightly connected to them uh, who are um, also acting within various agencies. Can That's right. And, and, you know, our side of this issue also has issue networks, but they're not nearly as well funded and well developed as the other side's issue networks. Um, but here's the here's the kicker um, is that it's 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 going to be tremendously difficult um, to help I mean, as talented and, and, and you know, um, ambitious as the uh, attorneys in these um, state attorneys general offices are. It's going to be very difficult to bring them up to speed um, in the in the space of just a few short weeks, to be able to cross examine the the the, the most you know the carefully selected, um, clever experts of the other side, whereas 
Uh, vice versa is not necessarily true. You have ACLU lawyers who have been cutting their teeth on this issue for years, um, and, and they're much better at, at doing cross-examinations on this type of issue. So that's, that's one example of a barrier. There are many others. Um, just to give one more example, because it's become extremely relevant in these lawsuits, the ACLU has been very, very capable of um, getting judges to buy into what I've been calling a no-true-Scotsman fallacy. And what they've argued is, it's reasonable for judges to defer to experts, to medical experts on this question, um, but who counts as an expert? Well, according to the ACLU, you are only an expert in gender-affirming care if you yourself practice gender-affirming care. And you can see why that would be a no true Scotsman type fallacy, because by definition, if you're a doctor who doesn't think that gender affirming care is a science based and ethical practice, you won't do it. And if that's the grounds for being excluded from having your testimony taken seriously by a judge, and that's, for example, what happened in, in Arkansas, um, then, you know, the, 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 the playing field is tilted from the get go. So half of the battle that the states are, are going to be facing over the next few months is getting judges to not buy into the no true Sc Scotsman fallacy of who counts as an expert. Lior, I'm curious, what is the space for therapists and medical practitioners who dissent from what we might call the gender ideology orthodoxy, uh, who are saying that I want to take a more exploratory um, therapeutic approach rather than just assume that we've got to embrace what is called gender affirming care from the get go? Right. Uh, great question. And, you know, just to say from the get-go, um, exploratory therapy in this context is absolutely crucial for achieving what in, in medical parlance is called differential diagnosis, um, meaning making sure that if you are going to medicalize um, gender incongruence, cross-gender feelings and behaviors, that you are reasonably certain that it, it's because um, those feelings and behaviors are evidence of a lifelong struggle that's not going to go away um, at the end of adolescence, as opposed to you know, gender dysphoria being caused by some underlying and unresolved mental health problems. So uh, exploratory therapy is absolutely crucial to, to minimizing the risk of false positives, and that's what the Europeans have understood and we still haven't. So the question then is, you know, if you're a parent um, or if you're a clinician and you want to, um, you want to either send your kid to one of these clinicians or you want to practice it yourself, um, to what extent can you do so? And, you know, the, the, the short answer to that is, um, and I, I regret to say this, um, that in, especially in blue states, there's about 20 states that have passed a variety of laws or regulations that um, really ramp up pressure on clinicians, especially mental health uh, clinicians, to not do that kind of careful exploratory work. Um, and they, the reason is because they, these states have classified that type of exploratory work as conversion therapy. Um, they've done so uh, under, again, the very superficial and semi-plausible analogy to, um, to homosexuality, where we, we do know with a high degree of confidence that uh, trying to use uh, psychotherapy to, to get a person to not be gay is not only um, likely to, be, uh, to end in failure 99% of the time, but is also likely to cause harm. Um, and, um, and so if you look at how these laws are structured... Um, they'll say things like, um, you know, the medical community recommends never to do exploratory therapy for sexual orientation or gender identity. In other words, the gender identity component of this is funneled in through or piggybacks on the sexual orientation component. Um, I should mention, second of all, that, uh, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics in 2018 came out with its policy statement. And, and the clear argument of the policy statement is... Um, any approach, any therapeutic approach that is not affirmative, meaning that doesn't automatically, uncritically, from the get-go, agree with a child that he or she, in fact, is transgender, is conversion therapy. That seems so um, peculiar. It seems like something that really goes against the ethic of the profession. The idea of exploratory therapy seems like something that is, um, you know, a well-established uh, practice. Um, so I, I imagine part of what happens is that, uh, you know, you're going to refer patients to clinicians just out of a sense of risk aversion, you know, kind of you don't want to find yourself running afoul uh, of, of these laws. So you're just kind of shunting patients to those therapists who decided I will not do anything remotely resembling exploratory therapy. That's exactly right. And I've, I, you know, I've, I've, I've heard this not just from parents who have run the gauntlet in especially blue states, although this happens in red states too, um, blue states like California, but also from clinicians in the field who treat and work with gender distressed, gender confused, gender dysphoric teenagers. And what they say is, 
you know, I get a patient, um, or you, because they usually do exploratory therapy, otherwise they wouldn't be talking to me. But, you know, my colleague, for example, who does, um, who, who is afraid of doing exploratory therapy because they, they're worried about losing their license. If they get a kid and the kid comes in and says, you know what, I feel like I might be trans. They say, well, you know, that's not really my area of expertise. I'm going to refer you to, um, the gender clinic. Um, if, you know, if you're in Oregon, for example, you just refer them to Dornbacher Children's Hospital Gender Clinic. And they have a, a team of mental health professionals and psychologists and so on and so forth, and they can help you. Um, now, of course, we know that as soon as a kid gets to one of these, um, uh, you know, one you're of these down clinics, the road to medical interventions. Right. Sense. Because because these clinics openly say we only have affirming clinicians. We don't have which is a code for we don't do exploratory therapy. We affirm only. Um, and so, for example, if the kid shows up, as is very, very commonly the case, if the kid shows up at one of these clinics and has severe coexisting mental health problems, schizophrenia, eating disorders, ADHD, everything, you name it, um, the assumption of these affirming clinicians is that those psychological problems are because of their unaffirmed gender. And therefore, that the only way to resolve them, the only way to address them um, uh, in, in a proper way is to uh, do, uh, do a gender transition. In other words, they adhere to the, an academic theory called the minority stress theory. Lior, you talked about some of the obstacles facing state-level lawmakers who are seeking to curb um, pediatric gender interventions. Uh, but I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what state lawmakers ought to do. Are there things that they can do that will make their approaches uh, more resilient uh, in order to try to create more space, for example, for therapists seeking to do exploratory therapy, uh, trying to ensure that um, clinicians uh, are taking a more evidence-based approach and being more cautious? Sure. Um, so let me say two things in that regard. One is with regard to the therapeutic side, the diagnostic side, which is really where the, you know, the um, um, exploratory therapy comes in. I think it's absolutely crucial for states. And I don't suggest for one second that blue states are, are going to do this because they're just not. But it's absolutely crucial for states to clarify in their laws and their regulations um, and even in the kind of the public comments of politicians that, um, that, that clinicians should, in fact, must do careful exploratory therapy. Um, you know, even if you believe that the, the supposedly more conservative Dutch protocol, which is the protocol for transitioning kids that came out of the Netherlands in the 90s and 2000s, um, even if you adhere to that uh, relatively more conservative protocol, it also calls for lengthy uh, psychological exploration prior to initiation of any um, hormonal interventions. So I think at minimum, um, states have to take their thumb off the scale and say to, to mental health, to the mental health professions, you need to do careful exploratory therapy or we're going to run into serious problems here. But again, we're nowhere near there. And in fact, blue states have been going in the opposite direction and trying to make... Is that something that would survive a legal challenge? I wonder, is your view that that's something that would be a bit more resilient given the opposition you're likely to get? So... Uh, if, so you mean like if a red state, for example, were to issue a, a law or regulation um, trying to beef up uh, provisions for exploratory therapy? Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, the other side of this is challenging in the courts every single provision, and every single regulation that touches on this issue. They're leaving no stone unturned. So, yes, I th it absolutely would, would be challenged in the courts. Um, so, so that's one component, um, you know, uh, making sure that there is adequate room for exploratory therapy and differential diagnosis. Um, the other is, uh, you know, there's a question of is banning these procedures for kids under 18, uh, imposing age, age restrictions, is that preferable to the European approach? And what the Europeans are doing now is Sweden, Finland, the UK and Norway looks to be joining soon. Um, is they're saying, look, as a general rule, we don't, we're not going to allow this in kids anymore, but we're going to make extreme exceptions, or I should say exceptions in extreme situations where there's been very careful screening, where the kid uh, by and large fits the profile of the original Dutch protocol. And importantly, because we recognize that the evidence base for these interventions is so incredibly weak, we're going to require that these kids only be eligible for hormonal interventions if they're enrolled in clinical research. Um, now, so the question is, is there room for an approach like that in the United States? Um, part of me thinks that that's where this is headed, um, that uh, it's going to be kind of, it's going to emerge as a kind of a compromise um, between the blue state approach of total deregulation and the red state approach of total prohibition. Um, 
Whether that's good or not is a separate question. I think one thing to, to, to contemplate here is that even the Dutch protocol, the supposedly more conservative gold standard of research in this area, and it's been called gold standard even by American advocates of gender affirming care, even by the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, even that Dutch study has been found to be very low quality evidence um, in, in European systematic reviews. And that is because uh, the Dutch study suffers from severe methodological problems, especially problems of bias. So if you're taking a step back and looking and asking the question, you know, is there a good research base for doing even what the Europeans are doing? The answer is that they have recognized that it's still an ongoing medical experiment and that we don't know the results. And it's very possible that when we start to see the long-term consequences, mental health consequences of these interventions, even in the Dutch cohort, um, we'll see that no, in fact, there's no justification ever to do early intervention in children. Um, we don't know that yet with, with a high degree of confidence. There are some people who say that, <clears throat> that you know, no child is born in the wrong body and there's no justification ever to give these treatments. I understand that argument. I'm sympathetic to it. Um, but I also allow for the possibility that you know, some adults really do suffer from acute gender dysphoria. Um, some of them report that their feelings started very early in childhood. Um, and, so, and, and some of them report that they feel better after undergoing some kind of medical procedure, um, even if that's not necessarily true because of placebo effects or any other confounding factor. Um, it does have some significance for the, for the debate. And so, you know, I, 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 I force myself to remain open-minded to the possibility that some kids may benefit from this, but where we are right now does not permit even that to be said. So if you were advising a state-level lawmaker, you would urge them to try to make their approach um, a bit um, broader so that you allow for these possibilities, so that you kind of build that in. Um, just because that's something that helps you build the case and also that allows for the possibility that future clinical research, uh, you know, might yield different answers. So, look, I mean, in theory, that's possible. In theory, yes. But here's another complication here. We have lots of evidence over the past few years that the doctors who gravitate into this field of research and practice um, and who actually do the gatekeeping or should be doing the gatekeeping but don't, who prescribe these hormones, who perform these surgeries, they are radical ideologues. Um, not all of them, but most of them, or at least many of them are. Um, they don't understand the basic principles of evidence-based medicine. We saw this um, in the, in the uh, example of the Texas um, House of Representative hearings over SB 14, where you had doctors um, uh, um, advocating for pediatric sex change modification um, showing not only that they don't, don't know the research behind this issue, but that they don't even understand the basic principles of how evidence-based medicine works. So this is one of those areas of, of potential state regulation where you say a profession is constantly furnishing evidence that it's unable and unwilling to regulate itself to impose any guardrails, um, uh, to exercise any self-restraint. And so what is a state medical board to do in that situation? What are state regulators to do? Can they just defer to the experts to exercise self-restraint after years of, of, of evidence showing that they won't? Um, so that's another complication here, that even if you believe that you know, the European approach in theory is preferable to the um, red state American approach, you run into the problem that um, unlike the European clinicians, and I don't want to glamorize the European clinicians because they certainly have some, some activists there too, um, but uh, the American uh, uh, medical community that's engaged in this area of practice does not seem to be nearly as responsible as its European counterparts. This is an enormously complex set of issues, uh, and uh, you've really enriched the discussion of this um, in, in the country writ large. You've written so much brilliant work on this. I wonder if you could leave us with some thoughts about the lessons we might take away from the complex relationship between the civil rights state and this um, quite a uh, significant cultural phenomenon. How should we think about um, just how we're approaching administrative agencies and how they might shape culture? Are there things that lawmakers, policymakers uh, ought to think about as um, y you know, you're thinking about you know, who should be serving in the Office of Civil Rights? Who should be staffing these agencies? What are the attitudes and inclinations they ought to bring to this work given how consequential it can be? 
a bit of a pessimist when it comes to the prospect of rolling back um, or, or reining in, I should say, the civil rights state. Um, it's just it's too powerful. Um, there are too many incentives against doing it. I think you know any Republican will probably tell you that if you touch this issue with a 10 foot pole, for example, you say we want to uh, scale back on the funding of the Office for Civil Rights. Um, you know, that's uh, maybe today things are a little bit different, but that's pretty much the end of your political career. Um, look, I mean, here's what I would say. Um, when it comes to the medical side of things, I think, first of all, we need to be absolutely clear and policymakers need to make clear. This is not a civil rights question with medical implications. This is a medical question with civil rights implications. Uh, they're thinking about it exactly backwards. And you see evidence of this in, again, court rulings, OCR determinations, um, HHS determinations. They lead with civil rights reasoning. They'll say things like transgender people have always been oppressed. They've, they're at the margins, this, that, and the other. Therefore, any attempt to kind of um, uh, constrain or restrict their access to these interventions is a violation of civil rights. Well, that's only true if, if these medical interventions are actually good and evidence-based um, and that they actually constitute medical care as opposed to iatrogenic harm. Um, so the, 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 the thinking about this is exactly reversed. And that's, I think, one of the, the lingering pathologies of, of the American civil rights state, the fact that we, we turn questions of policy first and foremost into questions of civil rights and everything has to be refracted through that lens. Um, you can see this, for example, in, in debates about how to restore order to, this, to, to the great American cities. Um, you know, rather than ask the question, what is a good method for uh, restoring order, reducing crime, you know, bringing business back, especially to inner city areas of commerce and so on and so forth. Um, anybody who's trying to answer those questions first has to answer the question, why is this not a violation of civil rights if we're going to have police officers um, uh, enforcing rules that have a disparate impact on African-Americans, for example? That's a very distorted way to think about public policy, but that is where we are. And it seems to me uh, very difficult um, to roll that kind of thinking back. Although, you know, we at, at the Manhattan Institute, I think, have, have really been trying hard and, and making some good um, progress in that, in, that, in that respect. So um, I think at minimum, as a first step, as a very modest step, um, we need judges because, again, the courts here are, are, are key. We need judges to think about this issue not from a lens of civil rights and law, but from a lens of medical practice um, and, 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 and deference to true expertise. So that's the first thing I'd say. The second is um, the civil rights state has to come back to its respect for process, procedure. And that means, especially in, in the case of setting policy on sensitive cultural issues, respect for disagreement, debate, vigorous engagement, um, you know, not shutting out one side of the issue because they've already been determined uh, to be um, anti-civil rights and hateful bigots. Um, and certainly when it comes to the question of uh, transgender medicine, that has been the case. There's very, very little inclination, for example, in the, um, in the Biden Department of Health and Human Services, um, to listen to contrary perspectives. And, the, you know, the evidence of that is what we see from Admiral Rachel Levin, um, who is touting talking points that um, the Europeans are frankly rolling their eyes at and asking how is it possible that such a senior uh, member of the Biden administration is saying that puberty blockers are completely reversible, that the evidence based is, is, is settled science on this issue, when everybody in their right mind knows that that's not the case. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that um, we don't have a good culture of respect for open disagreement, civil debate, um, even and especially on controversial topics. Lior, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Rehan. Listeners, don't forget to check out his work for the Manhattan Institute. We'll link to a scholar page in the podcast description. If you like what you heard on the podcast, please feel free to write a review wherever you listen, and be sure to tune in to future episodes of Manhattan Insights. I'm your host, Rihan Salam.